Um, first of all, I have to say thank you to everybody who's showing up. Uh, greatly appreciate you guys coming on uh, to listen to this conversation. Uh, as I said to Erwin already, I am very stoked about this. But, but secondly, I have to say, and more importantly, I have to say thank you to Erwin LaCour of Move Not Fame for uh, agreeing to have this conversation with me and talk about what he does. Thanks to so, you, Chris, for having me. Not a problem at all. So listen, Erwin, so first thing I have to say, okay, um, I'm sure most everybody who's going to come on here, they already know who you are. But just in case there are people who don't know who you are, please let us know. Just give us a, a little brief spiel about who is Erwin LaCour and what your experience is. Let's uh, burst on the, uh, on the fitness movement scene uh, over 10 years ago after a feature-length article uh, in uh, Mensa about my work, um, which I call Move Nat, and which I also called Natural Movement. The natural Movement is the term, generic term, that I coined 10 years ago to describe what my work is. And uh, so I'm known for um, bringing back onto, uh, you know, into the, the fitness world and the movement world that idea of uh, the complete practice of all the movement skills that make us human. Uh, we're talking moving on all fours, balancing, jumping, crawling, climbing, uh, jumping, running, lifting things, throwing things, all, all the practical movements, and also the movements that we do instinctively when we're kids. And so I, I brought that onto the scene um, at the time where was just pretty much completely forgotten by everybody, dismissed. And it's been 10 years now, and we are on the verge of taking this, this approach to fit, let's go mainstream. Yes. Um, so that's what I, I'm known for. Um, uh, almost 49 years old, father of three, um, living part-time in Mexico, part-time in New Mexico. Um, uh, author of the book, uh, The Practice of Natural Movement, and um, originally from France, now it is perfect, but I, I'm actually pretty much 100% of Irish and Scottish dis descent, so I'm from French Brittany. Okay, okay, so beautiful introduction to let us know a little bit, and you've touched on this um, uh, just a little bit in your introduction, but I want you to go a little bit more deeper into this. So. Um, and I want you to talk specifically about what exactly is natural movement and why do you feel that it was important to develop this practice? All right. Um, so natural movement, the way of coined it, and we're talking about um, 15 years ago almost. Again, uh, back then when I talk to people, ask me, what is it that you teach? Uh, so, okay, let's move that. Okay, what's move that? Well, so I had to move that is the name that I've chosen for the method of teaching what I do. Again, you're thinking about the, the whole scope of, of uh, um, real world physical skills that uh, we've forgotten to train and to also to train, practice as a whole, not as specialty sports, as a whole thing. And so I, I would say, well, that's natural. And people would be like, oh, yeah, um, yoga, um, tai chi, uh, pilates, you know, like every time I use the term natural, they would come up with something that had absolutely nothing to do with what is the practice, which now, after 10 years, over 10 years actually, of relentless work on making this concept known, this approach known. Now today, with natural movement, much, many more people understand that, oh yeah, like uh, walking, running, jumping, dancing, climbing, the whole, you know, the whole scope. But track back fast, people would ask me, hey, what's yoga? They well, no, that's not at all yoga. So I had to come up with the practice was there, the technique, the technique were there, 
the method I was in, the, in the already at the foundation and it's been constantly evolving. Um, but what wasn't there was the, the general understanding. And so I had to define it. I had to really, really redefine it. Also because if you said natural movement, then for the people who are not following this work, my work, you know, my, my company, my our community, uh, everybody may have an understanding. Like, do you mean spontaneous movement? Like, whatever I want, I'm going to do improvisation. Is it like uh, trying to be animal, crocodile, or monkey, or, you know, like a, a puma or something? Um, other people would think of some kind of a dance or, you know, so basically natural movement would be anything. What I did was to delineate um, a sequence of 12 principles, which all together, it's a whole philosophy, which all together make you truly understand what natural movement. And let's say if we were to simplify to, to some of the most important, um, I would use probably for one, it's, it's universal. It means all humans do it. And um, let's look at kids, all kids. They do natural movement. <laughs> before we take them. Before before we take that away from them. But my point is, you see them start to crawl before they can stand. Then they start to stand, to walk, they still stumble. Ultimately, they will run, they will jump, balance. They will start to hang, climb, they'll do all these movements. They don't do Tai Chi, they don't do yoga. Oh yeah, but they can do that part that oh, I see is not yoga. Those are just natural movements or natural physique. They will do that. So it's universal and it's instinctive. It, they start to do it before any form of instruction, before they even understand what's truly. There's an early stage of development, physical ability, where it's all instinctive. And it's instinctive because, again, it's universal. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you look at all those different skills that we've, we've talked about, that are, of course, they are relevant to the human species, to us as human beings. Um, dolphins would swim. Uh, birds would start to, you know, like mobilize their their wings, or they can try to fly. Uh, Surf will slither. Every species will have their own ways of motion. That is their natural to us. It's all those locomotive skills, manipulating skills, and, and, and even combative uh, skills. Yeah. Um, um, so their main, let's say, value or quality is that they're practical. practical. It's mm -hmm. really about survival of a living creature. Right? Uh, can the dolphin play and you know, maybe do flips and stuff? Absolutely, and that's going to be creative. But most importantly, the dolphin, the eagle, uh, the mountain lion, the zebra, the giraffe, the guinea pig, which shiver anymore. You know, like they have to survive movement. They mm -hmm. have to go after the opportunities that enable them to to feed themselves, and, um, and then they have to escape danger and threats. That's the primary reason why we move. It's really practical. And uh, the second quality that really makes movement natural, that it's adaptable. Okay. So it means you're in a certain environment, you can't just put it aside and be like, oh, I just want my, my roll out foam yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mat. I want no distraction. I want, you know, no crumbs on the floor, super stable, super predictable. Um, and I can close my eyes and I can be mindful. That's cool. But that's not natural movement. Natural movement, that means you're going to go through the world. You're going to have to interact with the world with a number of obstacles, variables, terrain, the texture, stable, unstable, predictable, unpredictable. Um, you're going to have to negotiate terrain in those environmental variables. That context where you move, you've got to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. And you generally don't find that in a studio or in a gym. 
in, a, in an artificial environment. You can find that in natural environment, in nature. Yes, yes. It's, you know, it's interesting that um, I'm not sure at what point we diverged from this path, but maybe, you know, if I think back, perhaps sort of in the 60s, 70s, with the kind of bodybuilding movement, where we started to become um, much more specialized and compartmentalized instead of this general fitness, right? And then we went down this path and it's just become ever more and more focused on specialized, 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 but to the detriment of, of all else, right? And, and I don't know, I'm just, just listening to you now, I'm trying to think to my head, at what point did we develop this current method of fitness, right? Um, that has led us down this path. I'm not sure. Okay, so that's a very good point you made, Chris, and a very good observation. Uh, I'm actually a, a student of the history of physical education. Um, so that idea of keeping yourself fit is a very, it's actually a very ancient idea. Um, our ancestors, uh, our university ancestors, um, they had to be fit. And you wonder how they would survive in complete wilderness with the rather rudimentary and effective technologies they, they, they've had created for hunting, <laughs> you know, building shelter, making a fire and all. Um, but regardless of these technologies, technologies are not, can't move. Mm -hmm. At least back then. Today, probably, you, know, you can't click on stuff. Um, you can destroy something at a distance by just, you know, doing a few clicks with a joystick. It's, it's crazy. You can also have pizza delivered to your place by just, you know, just a few clicks away from having food in front of you. So back then, um, technologies were immense. And more than ever, for a very, very, very long time, humans had to move. There was no other choice. And they mm -hmm. had to move in wild environments. Yes. Yeah. There was no such thing as an artificial environment. Probably the word, na the word nature did not even exist because there was nothing else. Mm -hmm. Outside, you know, the yeah. world. Yeah. Okay. So movement and now was obviously mandatory, not accessory the way it has become today. Mm -hmm. It's optional. Yeah. Um, so people would get ready. They would get ready for hunting. They would be get ready for, for war. They would uh, get ready for just being strong and reliable. Um, and we're not just talking about men, by the way. I mean, women have to carry wood, carry water. Uh, um, and that may be a generality because depending on whatever part of the world where you would be, roles, you know, depending on stuff like that would, would vary. But pretty much... I mean, women and men both were physically active in their own way, no matter what. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there would be anybody who would just be able to just sit on their butt all day and expect others to do things for them. Like, if you were that kind of person, you would be like, man, you'd be like, you're useless. You don't want to help. You don't want to contribute. Just go away. You're not effective. It's for the community. Exactly. So to be physically not necessarily elite, not necessarily, but to be healthy, uh, fit in the sense of being able to go through nature and, and do whatever chore, and whatever, um, yeah, physical chore, physical task you had to do was, was mandatory, except if you were maybe very old or too young, um, and uh, you, you were strong, be useful and helpful to the community long too. Okay. So, this is the this is um what was important for mankind for every person for a very very long time most of our history so just like I pointed out um the option of being physically idle or the option to be physically specialized as in choosing one specific physical activity that you do two three times a week or something 
is a very new thing. Mm -hmm. It's only it's a luxury that comes from from modern time. Um, now, in the sixties, uh, yes, uh, aerobic. We've found uh, uh, bodybuilding with Charles and Pierre, you know, the two icons, and and this is how the fitness industry. It's that's not where it's born because it was born a long time ago. Actually, the fitness industry was born over a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. There are already people putting programs out. You know, strongman kind of training, uh, some devices made for. And you would see, you see, if you look at the history, and you, see, you look at people wearing these clothes, like from Vic Victorian era, they're all clothed up. Yeah, yeah. They're, doing, they're already this kind of apparatus. I think the very first um, fitness device that looks like basically an exercise machine is from the 18th century, like made okay. of food and stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, but it obviously, it was just it was not developed the way it is. Uh, so in the 60s, uh, 70s, that's when it, it turns into uh, like a billion dollars industry, especially in the US. Um, and then when everything becomes highly specialized. So if you don't do a specialized sport, just do fitness, okay, that means machines for uh, muscle isolation. And then that means maybe some cardio, aerobic, and maybe some stretching a bit. Uh, and that's it. You're supposed to be fit by just doing that. But what was there before? Um, before in school and all the way until the 50s and 60s, and you see um, teachers having kids do balancing and some jumping, and some crawling and some running and all these natural movements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. Yeah. Literally. So you, 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 uh, you ask people, old timers, what, if they did any physical education in school, and they would say, well, we, have, we did that, we would run, um, you know, do some obstacle stuff. And uh, so, which was super healthy and super straightforward, very practical. And this, all this disappeared. Um, me, I'm, the, I'm part of a long line a long line of physical educators uh, that came for me. And uh, it's, a, it's a, like a lineage. And so my mentors are people like George Hebert and Friedrich Jan, depending on if you talk about, you know, like the French school or German school, where they were physical educators. <laughs> we're talking about, uh, in Germany, we're talking about uh, mid-90th and in France, late 19th century, early 20th century, where these, these prominent physical educators didn't call that natural movement, but they taught all these skills. They said, if you want to be physically capable, physically ready for the real world, you got to jump, you got to climb, you got to run, you got to lift heavy things, you got to do practice some, some uh, defense you know, skills. You get, a, you get ready for anything. Mm -hmm. You can't just be specialized. This is the way they train. They had some books out, some methods out, and um, dug into that. I looked at that here, and I uh, brought my own experience, my own research, and I created a new method, which is called MoveNet. And last, that a very important part of my work was not just to have a method, because anybody can create a method, right? It was to make this work No, It was to make this approach to physical education, to physical training known. At the time, we're talking again about, you know, 10 years ago, when nobody remembered what it was or saw the value or components of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I did. I made I made that idea popular. I made that idea become the verge of becoming true again. Okay. Now, um, somebody asked me if I were to put this on IGTV. Yes, I will. And then Andrew uh, Johnson asks here, uh, what do you feel is, uh, Irwin, what do you feel is what allowed you to pursue natural movement and not some other form of generalized practice? In, you mean in my, in my personal life? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I've done both, and I still do both. 
And so let me explain. Um, when I was a little kid, I just did what, at least normally, all kids should do, which is to have a natural development of an instinctive development of their natural movement ability. Um, and, and I was very fortunate that not only my parents would not discourage me to do that, as most do today. Mm -hmm. so number one, most kids today, they grow indoors. They grow yeah. indoors. Don't, don't get dirty and don't, oh, you don't want to get hurt. Yeah, indoors. And, and then they're constantly discouraged. It's a cultural thing. It's, it's, it's dangerous. You're going to get dirty. Blah, blah. And, and, and parents don't understand that actually this is extremely important. This physical development is not just a physical development. It's a, it's, it's a, a neuro. Yes. Um, it's a cognitive development. It yeah. has everything to do with brain function. So basically, mm -hmm. remove that from your behavior as a kid. You won't develop, you won't fully mature cognitively. Something is taken away from you. You've taken some of the natural development from you. Mm -hmm. There's no distinction between the body and the mind and, you know, like the physiology and the physiology of the brain. So very important. Bring that in there for parents. For like, movement thing all well, the natural movement is maybe the best thing you could encourage your kids to do if you want to uh, succeed including academic mm -hmm. uh so i was doing that but i was even encouraged my father would push me to climb a tree and uh, to go high and i would be scared I'd be like Ooh. you'd be like yeah you can't do it put your foot here put your foot here um he, you know, we wouldn't watch TV. There was no video games. There was, I had a black and white TV set with three channels and, and, and only, uh, you know, and TV programs only one hour a day or something. Um, you know, two hours a day, maybe at most. But then my dad would be like, just get out, just get outside. Yeah, yeah. Get outside. Go outside. I want you to watch TV. Um, you can't stay. You're just indoors. Just. And I would come back all bloody and it would be like, Lord, and he would be like, and so what? Just go rinse it off in the tap water. So it was, um, it was rustic. It was, it was just natural. And um, I would dig dirt all the time with my, with my hands and get dirty all the time. So um, I had a healthy physiological, um, neuromuscular that development thanks to that later on uh, you know i did some judo I did a bit of swimming um and then in school i did a little of you know volleyball and uh, this this kind of special and later on in my life early on in my adult life when i was 19 i joined a very confidential group called vital combat and basically, we would do some of the most. Um, we would do some very dangerous drills, like balancing and heights, and uh, jumping off bridges. And um, um, it was a whole lifestyle actually that included about every single lifestyle trend there is today. Um, that include intermittent fasting all the time, breathing exercises every single day, uh, cold exposure every single day, sleeping on the floor or like on very thing. Um, no TV, obviously no internet, no social media didn't exist. Um, so we could not show up. Tell hey, look, I'm doing this lifestyle, and it does not exist. It was like people would look at you weird because you were running barefoot and uh, <laughs> didn't, you know, we wear brands, uh, always barefoot, uh, kickboxing, the underground of, of or Thai boxing, underground of Paris, um, climbing bridges, uh, climbing roof, jumping from roof to roof before park or even existed. Um, so anything, you know, earthing, um, uh, we, we would eat exclusively organic food, um, you know, just, just name it. Anything today that has become some kind of lifestyle, some kind of guru, 
head of it with some science behind it and stuff. We did it before there was any guru and before there was any science and before there was internet and, and no way to talk about it. It was completely confidential. Mm -hmm. And risk-taking, um, yeah, frequently. Things where you want to be in your pants, um, things where if you make a mistake, you're dead. Um, there was no, it was not a military training or anything like that. It was a different kind of spirit forces. I don't have to call it. No, a different kind of fight club. Mm -hmm. Don't where, talk about fight club. First rule of fight club, don't talk about it. Yeah, well, now, now, that, is, now that, that was basically uh, 30 years ago, I guess I've earned the right to talk about it. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we did all of that. And uh, you were talking, you were asking me, Chris, about specialized training. I've done specialized training then later on. I've mm. done Olympic weightlifting. I've done trail running. I've done rock climbing. I've done... Um, short distance, medium distance, long distance, you know, Ironman distance, triathlon. I've done Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I may not have done any of these sports, special sports, um, to any high level, um, but they all have taught me something important. And so I've integrated the experience from these specialized sports in the the, the, the method that I've designed for teaching this form of complete real world physical education. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, currently I'm, I'm specializing in training currently on the breath holding and uh, getting into free diving. Yes. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's never fully specialized for me. So there's always, I keep practicing a lot of things, still see me balancing, climbing, jumping, doing these things. Okay, so let's. Uh, let me, I want to touch upon something that you mentioned in while talking there about that and, and about combat vital. And you were talking a little bit about barefoot. And I know that this is something that you do frequently. We talk about that in our in our own um, in our own facility. But talk to me about what do you believe is the relevance of training barefoot? And if somebody, if you were saying, if you were trying to get somebody to incorporate barefoot work into their training, how would you go about doing that? Um, when I was uh, 15, I started to compete uh, and, and all. And um, obviously, you're always moving on your feet and uh, you're speaking with your feet. And this is when I understood the importance solid feet. So when I realized that feet don't look, you know, they kind of look white, they look soft, they don't look that strong. And I realized that because they're in shoes all the time. Mm -hmm. That's when I started to uh, go a bit on like short runs barefoot and, you know, kicking walls and uh, trying to make them stronger. Uh, but it is when I was 19 and I met that guy, the, the guy initiated me to that, to that lifestyle I was talking about. We're talking about, so it's, it's, it's over 30 years ago. And back then I was 19 when I met him. It was my age and I'm about to be. Uh, and he looked really, uh, he looked, he didn't look like his age, right? The way he moved, the way he talked, his, his, his health, his, his charisma, and he was always very, they had just like super strong feet like that because of this thing. Um, so we we did all our training barefoot, and barefoot in the city. So we're talking about a broken glass, uh, anything that can poke your feet. You know, uh, we would go at night in construction sites. And I remember like and without with our lights, with our equipment, and I remember like stepping on boards with nails and all like multiple times. And you got to. And you just had to suck it up. I remember getting all these pieces of glass in my feet. I remember uh, the burning, you know, the hot, hot concrete, or just running for too long on concrete and having, you know, uh, at first um, um, blisters before they became calluses. But eventually, you become strong with your feet. Um, your feet become strong with your movement behavior. So, what's the point of that? Um, a big point of that to me. 
was, and actually, it's been it's been uh, something I thought about at the time when I really started to be a, a young, years old and think of what I wanted to do, but also what I wanted to be in my life. And I started to have a vision for myself that I would um, that I would be strong in the sense of physically capable, not strong in the sense of big biceps and big muscles, strong in the sense of physically capable in any way that is necessary. I could run, run, fight, I could do all these things, and I could do it with, I could do it naked. Like mm -hmm. I was imagining me if I, if all my clothes are removed, I'm just naked. What do I look like? Mm -hmm. What can I do with that? Body? Okay. So sometimes you see guys train, they exercise, and they show their calluses and stuff. And yeah, show me your feet. Mm -hmm. And like the toughness that you're proud of, and that's legit. Right? That's totally legit. It's good to have strong hands. But the toughness that you're proud of with your hands, do your feet reflect the same? Mm -hmm. or are your feet again all white, all soft? Maybe complete like sport because they've been in those shoes too long. Um, it became a subject uh, of, of, you know, it, it was brought to people's attention after Born to Run. But Born to Run, that's uh, eight years ago, uh, 10 years ago now, about 10 years, just when I moved to the West. But for me, that was 30 years ago. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that idea of, okay, I lose my shoes. No problem. I still can go run even on tough terrains. I'm not like, oh my God, oh, it hurts. Oh, it hurts. I can't. You see, sometimes they're always amused uh, when I'm in, I'm, I'm in April. I mean, often uh, and you, in the summer, and you see guys, sometimes, you know, fit, strong looking guys, and they take off their shoe, and then maybe it's not sandy. It's like some pebble stone or on a. You know, Swimming hole, there's some rocks and stuff. See, like going like, oh, 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 like super slow and clumsy. I'm like, I, I'm not telling them anything, but to myself, I think this is not really a reflection of strength. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is a reflection of you are indoor strong looking, but when you are outside in nature, you you're not very capable. Starting mm -hmm. being comfortable on your feet. You want to look like some kind of a feline human, you know, that's like a tiger or something. But you can't move like one. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, show me what you got. Yeah, yeah. Because the way your body looks doesn't mean anything. That's for pause. Mm -hmm. And it's okay if it makes you feel strong. But to feel strong or the self-image of strong Yes. The actual expression of strength through actual physical capability, it's a completely different animal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not telling that to look like it, to sound like it did or be to just, you know, it's just a really fundamental observation to me, which still so many guys are carefully avoiding, right? Because everybody wants an image of fitness, the image of function, not necessarily function. Yeah, yeah. When I talk about function, Chris, and you, you are into rehab, you, you know exactly what function I'm talking about. We're not just talking about the physiological health of, you know, your, your, your tissues and your joints and your fascia and that you can have looseness and actual range of motion and all of that in function. We're not just talking about the function. We're talking about the application of function and that's where i'm talking about the practical mm -hmm. practical mm -hmm. physiological and neuromuscular and cognitive preparedness it's a whole thing and still so many people want to avoid that the discussion mm -hmm. because when you feel strong in whatever physical practice you got you feel strong you don't want to be brought again out of your comfort zone that it took you so long to, to develop a comfort zone in the gym, big biceps, you know, like muscles and stuff. And now you look good. And all of a sudden, somebody like me, French arrogant bastard, is just, you know, like, boom, <clears throat> like slaying this and be like, hey, maybe you have to start all over again. <gasps> what? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to. 
well, <laughs> friends, you look strong, but you're not strong. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Well, it's funny, you know, um, I talked to uh, um, a retired Special Forces guy, Pat McNamara, um, a yeah. cu couple of months ago. And, um, you know, he, he has this, this saying that I quoted uh, at a talk at a medical conference. And he said, you know, your fitness, you do fitness and you should be fit for four reasons. Number one, for longevity. Number two, to be able to save yourself. Number three, to be able to save somebody else. And mm -hmm. number four, to kick ass, right? Those <laughs> are the four reasons why you should be fit, right? And when, yeah. you, talk, and when you talk about um, capability, right? You are talking about a capability that goes beyond even those things because it adds another dimension. It's not just, hey, I should be capable when I'm indoors and I have my shoes on and all of that. I should be capable anytime, anytime, anywhere, and in any situation, right? So, exactly. And it, it so uh, what Pat, um, um, what this special guy, uh, special this guy says is exactly uh, uh, what I'm talking about. And um, and obviously he knows his thing. And um, as a matter of fact, I still multiple times. And uh, one of my good friends recently retired uh, still from the door and he's moved not certified and he trains and always highly recommends this method he says it's not flashy but brilliant and uh, highly practical and he's um, um, yeah he's exposed as many uh, of these you know uh, um, you know brothers to uh, to this methodology of training and uh, just because it works and um, when you say it adds a dimension I kind of want to say, I see your point, but it's almost like it's a different dimension. Mm -hmm. It's a different dimension. Mm -hmm. It's a dimension of its own where the way you look, it's not that it doesn't matter. Uh, there's, not, there's nothing wrong in, in seeking a good looking body, but that's not your starting point. That's, For sure. That's neither your only concern. It's not even your primary concern. Primary concern is um, so in my in my case priorities are number one um, real world physical capability you're capable in the real world to help others to help yourself to help others I like to put it that way is that the best way to make sure that you find yourself physically helpless is to become make yourself physically helpful mm -hmm. to yourself and to others. Uh, this is straight from uh, uh, the book of uh, uh, George Hubert and that mentor like a century ago that uh, I draw a lot of my inspiration from. Mm -hmm. uh, so be that already. Then it's for your health. And health, obviously, physical health, mental health, and that's indeed longevity. Um, being almost 50, you know, pushing 50, my health level, but also the way I'm, my energy level, it's, it's nothing at all like a typical 50 years old guy or 40 years old guy. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, today, like even like 30s, 30s, 20s, not even at those levels of health and physicality. This is not to brag. This is not actually something I am um, that makes me um, happy. No, it's, it's, I would, it's sad. I, you know? I would prefer to be out of work because that means that society as a whole, like generally speaking, people would have so much physical capability and physiological health. And I'm sure you feel the same, right? It's like you treat, you treat people who are patients who have a, a, a physiological ailment that, that your expertise uh, enable you to help with and, and um, but what you understand I'm sure with a little frustration is that people are going to come back with the same problem not because your treatment was ineffective obviously it is very effective but because the cause of the problem which is their lifestyle and what it is made of and what's missing mm -hmm. has not been addressed yes yes 
And this is why we have so many people, uh, healthcare practitioners who train and learn MoveNet because they understand, and it's a big trend now, that they have to educate people. Yes. And to also inspire them, but to really educate, teach them, do this movement, do this, do that. So that combined to the therapy, it's much more effective, makes the therapy more effective, but also makes the therapy last longer, the, the, the positive effect of it lasts longer, because you, you maybe not fully remove, but you drastically reduce the negative impact of a healthy lifestyle, because you educate people at least to some, you know, healthy natural food. That yeah. By just doing a little every day, that can have tremendous um, positive impact on, on anyone's health. For sure. It's, so. uh, it's interesting, you know, I tell people this story of um, when I opened up our facility and I was an orthopedic surgeon. I'm not a business person, right? So I, I had hired a, a business mentor to help me um, to, to get the business side of it. And at some point, we mutually fired each other, okay? Because we disagreed. Because he, he was of the philosophy, oh, you know, you bring all these people through, you just give them this stuff, and then you keep bringing them back, bringing them back. And I said, no, you don't understand. So I'm, he said, in a way, I am trying to put myself out of business because I would like to educate people. Because this is the problem. They have no education. They don't understand. They, and they don't see that little changes can make a huge impact. And, and in the end, we had to fire each other because he kept telling me, no, 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 you're doing it wrong. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't understand. We're trying to educate people to help themselves and give them the tools with which to be able to do so. You're a good man. You have a, a sincere desire to help people not to turn them into dependent customers that want to come back to you uh, to get their, you know, their, their medicine um, so that, you know, you have like return customers. If you, this, you, they are patient with you. There are people you want to uh, genuinely help, whereas that other person, the way we describe, you know, what they're trying to do is that they see people as a business. And so they see people as customers and, uh, in, in any business, you know that um, having your customers return is easier than reaching out to find your customers. Um, you don't operate from that, that mindset. You don't have that heart. Your heart is to help people. So you, you want to see them only as much as it's necessary for them to feel better. And then you, you kind of want to tell them, just, okay, get out. Yeah. Don't come back and it will yes. see you again. Yes. But your hope um, in the MoveNet um, community and uh, MoveNet uh, training, it, it just people who are true educators at heart, that's the way they feel. They, at some point, you have to, that you call them patients or students. At some point, you want to let them, you want to see them go because they've learned everything they had to learn. Whatever they're gonna keep learning, they can do it on their own. Your work is not necessary. It's been done and successfully. That's what a true educator feels. That's the hope of every true educator. It's not to make people in, uh, dependent, it's to make them independent, to make them self-reliant. Mm -hmm. um, my goal through what I do is turn as many people to equip them with those uh, immaterial, that immaterial equipment, skills, physiology operation and the experience uh, that, that again equip them with that physical, real world physical preparedness capability for the whole life form, which I believe should be done for every human being the kids. It should be what the, the core of every physical education program in every school in all over the world is like make kids physically capable and teach them 
support what they're doing instinctively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and add the techniques that make their movement even more efficient. And really ingrain that so deeply in who they are that they never forget about it. And they always make sure to maintain that capability for as long as they can, regardless of what they do in their life. So that they always, you know, they, they know how to be and stay healthy. They, they keep away most physical, physiological, you know, ailments, health, ailments, health problems. Um, they're capable to help themselves and help others in case of need. Mm -hmm. And they're free to travel. They're free to they have a self-confidence. They have a self-esteem that stems from knowing that they're physically capable. The same way you have more self-confidence and self-esteem when you know that you're intellectually, mentally capable, emotionally capable, spiritually capable. It's all one. It's all one being. It's all one person, one life. This mm -hmm. is the foundation for creating, creating the life you want. And you take any of those elements away and then you have a limitation of what you can express and experience in this life of yours that is so precious. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you touched upon something there that I want you to, um, I'm going to give you a magic wand now, okay? And so I'm going to say that Earl LaCour is in charge of teaching um, a, a physical education in the schools and introducing physical literacy to our children. Tell me how you would do that. How would you achieve this? <laughs> uh, if, very, if, if, if I gave you a magic wand, of course. But thank you, I appreciate it. Actually, I'm equipped with multiple magic wands in my life. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, they are, they are, yeah, you know what I mean. I know. Um, you, you've got to, I mean, just, just, Thinking is a magical wand. Just the ability to imagine and create the reality that you want for yourself and what you want to contribute in the world and to do that with confidence and satisfaction. That's, it's like a magic power. Mm -hmm. um, but so this being said, very simple, very simple. Create the environment. Okay. So... When I was a kid, we would go play anywhere. In the backyard, in the, in the woods, nature, in the park, everywhere. Kids were always attending that, okay, they're not given electronics and phones where we can just do that because it definitely this is electronic heroin for kids. They yeah. become highly addicted to it. It's just like heroin in an electric form. Mm -hmm. So you take that out, okay? Uh, what's really the drive for kids to have fun and to challenge themselves and just to experience something new? And usually they want to do it normally, at least when they're really healthy. They want to do it through their movements. Now, when you have the environment like that, imagine... Outdoors or indoors, that doesn't matter, but there would be ropes to swing from and obstacles, some stuff to climb and jump and go through and all. You just have that. What are kids going to do? They're going to play, have incredible fun. Okay. That's what you do. Now, you're going to tell me, well, let's just play. Well, in kids, play is very difficult too, but really to have kids stick to something and not look at the clock and, don't, and not be bored. When it's fun, time flies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, when, and when time's out, time's up, they're like, can, can we keep doing it? Crap. So you do that and you let them just do whatever they want spontaneously for some time. And then you start to structure that. You start to be like, okay, how would you pass that, that obstacle, that environment? How would you go through this? How would you jump from here to there without stumbling, without pushing on the other side? How would you climb on top of the bar 
to begin with. And once you can do it, how many ways can you do the same um, that maybe you don't know? There are like eight techniques. There are several jumping techniques, several, several crawling techniques. There are so many hand positions, climbing movements, so many. I wrote a whole book about it, that's 500 pages. So support what you do naturally, all of them universally, that they are in America, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of what their parents do, regardless of any kind of you know identity saying that we would hope people one day would stop thinking about mm -hmm. what's bringing people and kids together is that fun and that movement yes. and yep. that, that capability and by the way it's not fun it's not just about fun uh when you pay attention you you can see how kids challenge themselves how they take risks I sometimes they scare themselves of trying something. How they push themselves to the point of being completely out of breath. Not just fun in the sense of, oh yeah, I'm having fun. They are really, fun is more a tool, not a finality. It's a tool. So, because part of that evolutionary psychology, physiological agenda of developing optimum physical capability it's in the program it's there they want to be strong they want to be capable they want to be able to run sprint jump land hang climb lift throw talk everything wrestle so a physical education program that would be really awesome is to have those props in those environments where you have multiple possibilities of having what they do instinctively but in a more structured way not fully structured but because it, you know it's psychology is that they, they can't always just stay focused on one thing um, too long mm -hmm. um, but teach them some techniques and uh, let, let, let nature and instinct do the rest mm -hmm. really yeah yeah. Well, it's, it's it's interesting, you know, we have all these kids that are quote unquote ADHD because they won't sit still in a chair and listen to somebody talk for hours on end. When, as you just mentioned, when you are out playing, I can think back to when I was playing as a child, right? And you're outdoors playing. Basically, you would go out after supper. We wouldn't come home until it was dark. And to, you know, you can hear your mother in the distance calling, Chris, Chris, the street lights are coming on. It's time to come home, right? And you, you're focused on what you're doing for hours on end. It's not that they, these children lack focus, right? They are able to focus. It's that we've, um, and, you know, certainly there are some kids that are maybe far at the end of the spectrum. They're very, very hyperactive. But in general, I would... Um, I would tend to think that many of these kids, it's just that they, they lack physical stimulus. They do not have enough physical stimulus and they're not doing enough things. They're not active enough. And so that boils over into these periods when we want them to be quiet and still and they cannot do that. They reject the program that is imposed to them. Mm -hmm what they're supposed to focus on, how they're supposed to physically behave, which is just still, in the environment, fully artificial, including what they're fed, what they drink and eat, the light is artificial, the environment is artificial, they're indoors, they're jailed, they're confined, and they, the core of their soul rejects that. They just don't have the, the words to express it. Mm -hmm. They can say, what is this madness? I'm <laughs> supposed to be outside in the sun or in the rain or in the wind, looking at trees, looking at a horizon, putting my, you know, digging earth with my, with my nails, going barefoot, going wild, yelling to the top of my lungs, 
running until I'm out of breath, taking a risk, having fun, exploring new things, never be, almost never be still, or actually sometimes being still, but just absorbing, looking at an ant or looking at the clouds. Or... And parents who listen to me be like, oh yeah, that guy's a romantic dreamer. You may say I'm a dreamer, I hope I'm not, I know I'm not the only one, you know, like paraphrasing John Lennon. Mm -hmm. But excuse me, parents, what you've been brainwashed, believing that you're going to have the best kids if you like force them into that cultural indoctrination that is completely insane. Mm -hmm. And you believe that's the most rational and most productive and most reasonable, the most sensible. Uh, God, I almost want to sing the song, you know, by uh, uh, God, Super Trump. You know, when I was young, I used to, you know, I used to think of everything was wonderful and everything, and it taught me to be sensitive, uh, sensible, critical, cynical. So the whole world around you wants to wants to come find kids. And uh, the parents, a lot of them don't really want to spend real time with the kids, so they give them electronic, so that they get rid of them electronically, so they can themselves just be absorbed by their Facebook or Instagram or whatever, or work at mm -hmm. online. I use the internet too, I use computers too, and sometimes you know, it's, they watch shows. But they spend so much time out. They have so much free time. They do bow and arrows. They go barefoot. They climb a tree. They are absolutely nature. Um, you would say, well, well, they're probably wasting time, right? Shouldn't they be in a classroom for hours a day listening to teachers and learning stuff so that they can have a good job? No, not at all. Because actually, this won't make them that smart. It will make them educated, like filling their brain with tons of knowledge, and that's cool. But there's no knowledge that cannot be learned. Some people, they get a PhD at age 70 or 80. Right? Yeah, you can learn a skill, a new skill at any time. However, if you're late in the sense of missing the physiological and cognitive windows that happen take place in your development and the development of your brain function when you're a little kid and you're already frustrated and feeling confined, feeling jail, feeling bored. You will resent everything. You will mm -hmm. develop illnesses because your soul is trapped and you don't know, you may not be able to understand what is wrong in your life because you're a little kid. Mm -hmm. But what your soul knows, what inside your psyche knows, that you need freedom, you need movement, you need risk taking, you need nature, you need uh, all these things that make us human. Okay, let's use a metaphor. You take a baby dolphins, little dolphin, baby, yeah, yeah, and you remove them from their parents out of the ocean where you have infinite, almost infinite distance and depth and currents and changes in temperature, changes in light, changing in everything and where you can learn to hunt and you can just play with your little, you know, kids, dolphin friends and all of that. You take them, put them in a swimming pool full of chlorine, fish, uh, um, feed them dead fish, and then teach them to do tricks for tourists. We, Chris, you're talking about kids with HDHD. Yeah. And uh, I was using a metaphor. Um, with the dolphins. With the dolphins. And uh, obviously I could have chosen any other animal, but um, so let's imagine the healthy development of, of wild dolphins from from birth um, and obviously um, just like there are baby 
baby animals. There are baby dogs. Have you ever seen a photo of baby dogs? Just crazy cute. But uh, they're born in the ocean and they grow up in the ocean. So you want to think a vast, almost limitless, limitless um, environment, liquid environment, um, where you have currents, you have a crazy uh, space, including depth. You can, this, they learn to dive, they learn to go back up, to breathe. So they learn about, you know, naturally, they learn to communicate, they have language. They learn, you know, social behaviors that's proper and that's not proper. They learn to create threats. There's so many things you need to learn in a, that you will learn through play and through direct instruction by your, your parents, dolphin parents, or the you know, pod, um, where you have a whole community, a little group where dolphins, young dolphins, learn to be healthy and capable young dolphins. You can't imagine them being bored, having a PhD, um, and all that, you know. They're just, they're not healthy if you don't make it, period. And when we talk about healthy, it's physiologically healthy, emotionally healthy, you know, um, healthy. Um, so what makes young kids today have so many issues, so including HDHD looks like they can't focus, they, they can't uh, get their attention right. Um, and obviously some kids are totally fine, but a lot are not. And then you give, start to give them medication as if that was the answer, not thinking that maybe their underlying issue is deeper. That's actually simpler than it looks. You, you look at the, the upbringing Typical kid today, artificial it is at that level. Birth of artificial, not like through a section, completely artificial. In an artificial, um, they were the fed, they're not breastfed anymore. Artificial food, that's not what babies are supposed to feed with. They're supposed to feed with the milk of their mom. All the good stuff that's in it. Environments where if the air artificial, the air is polluted because of the environment, you know, full of plastics and solvents and stuff. Brief pollution all day. Artificial lights, artificial sounds. Maybe stress, stress parents lacking healthy relationship, uh, lacking downtime to rest, lacking happiness. I don't know. There's just so many aspects, lacking sleep, feeding themselves with junk food, watching shows that are just not, not making a person necessarily relaxed or, you know, happy or a meaningful sense of what life is about. And you may think, oh my God, yeah, it's judgmental. It's not that I'm judgmental, it's just an observation of what's healthy and what's not healthy. So let's imagine that you take a bunch of baby dolphins just born, and instead of growing up healthy, happy, and free and strong in the ocean directly with, with that little community, with the parents to begin with, spending a lot of time very close to their parents, being fed complete natural food in a complete natural environment, you plunge them in a swimming pool that's made of whatever, water with chlorine and things in it that doesn't go bad. There's no space. There's no depth. There's pollutant in the, in the water. There's no currents. There's no change of temperature. The food they eat is dead, maybe artificial. They don't even get to hunt it. They're just fed it. Um, and then you expect them to do tricks so that it's going to entertain, you got to prepare them to get to have a job, right? The job is going to be to entertain people for money. Yeah, well, they're going to let themselves die because there will be their instinct of like, this is completely messed up. There's no way to live here. And if they survive, they won't be the happiest, healthiest dolphins. Right? And, and you would compare. A dolphin grown and raised, which, by the way, I don't even know if 
possible to do that. I think that you taken out of nature as the ocean as adult and tamed into that kind of life. Mm-hmm. And then they start to lose their strength because they can't accelerate, they can't, you know, dive, they can't do any of those movements. They are in an environment of the ocean. So, so it's imagining that the caretakers of dolphins realize, like, well, how come these dolphins are not like the others? And they, wow, well, how come they're not, seem to be depressed, they're not so, so healthy, they have all these health issues and stuff. And they'll be scratching their hands and be like, they're bad dolphins. They have dolphins with problems. <laughs> it's going to be their problem, right? Like, seriously? Yeah, yeah. Seriously. So, uh, you would do the same with an elephant, with, uh, you know, uh, young elephants, young lions, young whatever. So, you can't compare wild animals with our typical pets, like cats and dogs, that have been with us mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of years. Our dogs are not the their wild counterparts, which are wolves. Our little cats are not their wild counterparts, that are bobcats or mountain lion. Just mini cats, mini dogs, not necessarily very strong. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, probably let them in nature, they're gonna die. They will know how to survive. Mm-hmm. Okay. So humans, why would be humans any different just because we believe in that normalcy thing, that idea of a normalcy where it's okay, it's okay to be fed artificially, to grow up in artificial environments, to be imposed artificial behaviors, physical behaviors, social behaviors, mental behaviors, to be imposed to you that are not what humans are designed for, are designed to grow up doing and living doing and being. It's far mm-hmm. away from it. Mm-hmm. That's it. So yeah, is the the answer medication? Oh yeah, that's probably medication. Probably we need more or better, more efficient medication. We need more science behind this so that we can have perfect molecules that are gonna fix their brain. Or maybe we just finally need to understand that there's a certain level of zero insanity in trying to force young human beings, regardless of who they are, you know, like ethnicity, uh, gender, um, the parents, all these considerations. It's a biological, it's a universal biological reality. And, tr- and if you want to dismiss it, you will pay a price. In this case, kids will pay a price. Kids will be seen as like bad kids. Inadequate. Insufficient. Which is such a profound injustice. It's, it's borderline criminal to me that you would think that those kids have a problem while completely dismissing the idea that their whole environment, their whole, everything that we try to imposed to them is what's inappropriate and unhealthy. And that's my answer. And I don't care. Yes, but but I don't care. Mm -hmm. Those kids need to be outside and they need to move and they need real light from the sun and they need their eyes to see a horizon and they need the freedom to climb a tree, to dug the earth with their fingers, to throw stones, to giggle, to have free time to have exploration, to have true freedom and true happiness through their through nature and through nature and through their instincts and behavior. I'm not saying that they should be led to be completely wild. This is obviously not what I implied. I'm not talking about the reverse extreme. I'm talking about the balance. But when you offer only a hundred percent fully artificial environments and 100% artificial behavior. That's an extreme. Yes. And what people don't see, a lot of people don't see, including parents who deal with their own kids and they don't know what to do. 
is that that normalcy is an extreme and it doesn't work. It doesn't make kids healthy and happy. There's no way. Because you, mm -hmm. you can't fool nature. Yeah, yeah. You cannot dismiss and neglect and betray nature. Mm -hmm. You can't. Period. There's no yeah. pill that's going to fix that. There's no fear pill that's going to fix that. Yeah. I, I like that very much. So... Um, I'm gonna. So we got. I have one more question. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, you did speak a little bit about this, but I want you to be more specific now. Okay. Um, so um, MoveMath has um, a part of it that is um, associated or that is used by medical professionals such as myself. Okay. So speak to us about um, how. Do you think that the principles of MoveMat, MoveNat, can be utilized in healthcare, um, in the healthcare setting, for the treatment um, and treatment of and the prevention of injuries in in patients? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the let's say the um, the the premise the. Um, the assumption is that most, and not, obviously not all, but most functional ailments that so many people today, modern people, suffer of by the millions, lower back ache, you know, bones uh, don't, don't have full range of motion, all of that, like of strength, sarcopenia, inflammation, um, have to do with lifestyle so I'm talking about not just a lack of movement and I'm not just talking about a lack of natural movement I'm talking about lack of sleep artificial food uh, lack of being outside um, stress so all of those, you know, we, we may isolate me. Oh, well, you lack such vitamin. You lack such mineral. That's why you have this problem. Well, you have those genes. So your parents were like, okay, so you're like that. Like, like Well, um, we can try to pinpoint the cause, you know, aside from, you know, like the accident. It's like somebody's in a crash or something. Well, mm -hmm. Very different. But when a 20 years old, 30 years old, you know, not just 60, 50, 60, 70 years old, when, when even young people come to your to your office and they have those, I, I would not necessarily say a dysfunction, but they have like suboptimal function. They have like just physical issues. Mm -hmm. And that there doesn't seem to be a cause of it, right? It's like in the sense of like a cause that you can truly, truly identify, like that cause. Somebody tells you, hey, my neck is, is messed up. Well, I was in a car crash six years ago. I never did anything about it. And now uh, six months ago, I started to have this pain, like crazy and all. And you're like, yeah, well, you never dressed that. You had that car crash. It's that easier to pinpoint. But otherwise, like, why do you have this issue? Why do you have neck pain? Why do you have uh, upper back pain, lower back pain, uh, hip pain? Uh, uh, so many f possible manifestations of some underlying issue that we can possibly list. So definitely, you know, if people don't sleep enough, if they eat bad food, like artificial food all the time they're stressed out all the time there's going to be a physical physiological manifestation in some way of a cause so you can have symptoms that come from that cause or those causes come by now movement 
doesn't seem to be part of your environment, right? It's not like you, you like movement, but it's not like you like a mineral, a vitamin, you like a, a, some mac, a micronutrients or something, or you have a hereditary issue. Movement doesn't seem to be part of your environment, yet to me it is your environment. Means that you are your own environment. Your physical behavior becomes your environment. It becomes a stressor, a stressor in a good sense or a bad sense. Of term. So, if you sit idle all day, if you breathe shallow, if you have your 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 organs are not supposed are not doing what they're supposed to do, they're not moving in the with the intensity, the, especially with the frequency before the intensity. They're not with the frequency that you're supposed to. So basically, you don't squat, you don't deep squat, you don't kneel, you don't get up, get down at the time, you don't change position frequently, you don't even walk. And if you do walk, you walk on flat surfaces, maybe up and down a few stairs, but you're not dealing like barefoot with an even environment. You're not at all behaving the way your physiology expects you to behave. So if you shrink that original natural movement behavior to a minute, which is what most people do today, they sit most of the day. When they don't sit, they stand or they, they just walk a few steps. Their movement, when there is some movement, aside from seating, usually in a flat position, aside from seating, the movement is e extremely reduced. All they do is stand and walk. And when they do walk, they walk on flat, predictable environments with shoes on. And you do that for many, many years. What happens to the body? What happens to all the amazing function that you're supposed to that you once had as a kid mm -hmm. and that you're supposed to not only maintain you're supposed to develop the optimal level as a kid as a teenager as a young adult and then to maintain for as long as as possible this is that used to be the program this used this used to be what all humans used to do no today you have literally generations of people by the millions who are born and raised indoors on the freaking couch. And all they do is movement for the most part, and especially as they grow older, they go study, they go to school and stuff, is to sit, look at a digital screen of some sort, eat a natural, artificial, unhealthy food, lack sleep, get stressed out early on in their life, and when it comes to movement, in terms of um, frequency, variety, intensity of their movements alone, plus in terms of the environment where they, these movements take place. You wake up, you're idle all night. You wake up, you're going to be idle again very soon. Mm -hmm. Right? You're going to sit somewhere, look at your phone, open your laptop, check out stuff, work, be on your screen all day. Not all people, okay? So some people still have some manual work and labor work, but usually it's repetitive. They're on their feet, but they don't get to run and jump and do all these movements, right? It's artificial environment, repetitive task. For the most part, right? The generality. Mm -hmm. But it's still, we're talking about millions of people, most people today. Chris, as a healthcare practitioner, what do you think is going to happen to their tissues, to mm -hmm. their function, mm -hmm. to their muscles, to their joints, to their fascia, to, all their, to their nerves, to their ligaments, to their tendons, to, to, to their cells, when they are not used in the way they're, they're supposed to be used? What happens when you don't use it? It goes away. Yes. That's it. So mm -hmm. what you see w coming to your office needing treatment, there are people which function has been shrinked for a long time. Mm 
it's mm -hmm. shrunk function it's it's uh disused not used this and misused function that you try to mobilize and recruit and have move and like kind of revive it's just like somebody stops breathing you know you try to revive them and you have bodies that basically stop being alive <laughs> they stop they stop working yeah and you try to revive them you're like i'm gonna reignite this thing boom you're gonna just start to want to trigger things so something happens in the tissue but also something happens in the nervous system and hopefully in people's behavior too so they're like wait a minute i need to move more in my life if people were to just move not just more not just more frequently as in multiple times a day uh, but also the variety of movement because if all you do is run you run three times a, a week you're like yeah i'm physically active sure you are that's much better than doing nothing but do you deep squat mm -hmm. do you kneel do you get up and get down do you hang do you climb do you jump do you run uh you step on uneven terrains for your feet to be strong and nimble and you know healthy do you ever do any of these things no okay well, then your function is limited and therefore you will lose it even though you run three times a week mm -hmm. it's not enough mm -hmm. running is not the end of be all or whatever single specialized physical activity that you can have three times a week even five times a week it should be multiple events of movement of diverse movement every single day of your life if you want true physiological health but also to feel good in your head or cognitive function because it boosts it boosts cognitive function it boosts the brain which means you feel fresher crisper hungrier in, in your mind more creative. more alert or mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's it's one we got to stop putting ourselves into those boxes we got to stop compartmentalizing them. yes well and in essence movement is the medicine movement is the medicine it's absolutely the medicine but so is sleep so yes. is nature so yes. is community and friendship and laughter and love and faith and imagination and every single aspect that makes a human and that none of them can be neglected truly if you see health you can't just be like oh i'm feeling a little foggy i probably need more vitamin c or i'm probably deficient in some minerals like really <laughs> really well maybe Have you ever considered that it's been nearly months that you haven't stepped outside or truly been outside in nature? Mm -hmm. You've been trapped in that city for so long. Have you considered that maybe looking at screens all day, hours a day, even that's cool, interesting things. Sure, maybe you're learning stuff that are great. But do you really believe that this is all that yourself, your building, your brain, your whole being and your brain in your body is to do and that that could be the cause of you not feeling good at some point mm -hmm. have you ever thought that maybe don't stop eating from morning to late night and then give a never give a break to your metabolism to your organs same thing mm -hmm. that you never push yourself a little physically never get out of breath same thing mm -hmm. that you lack sleep every night even a little same thing that you take life too seriously you're, you never laugh never been a little never you know never allow yourself to be a little, same thing mm -hmm. that you don't have touch you don't have somebody to touch you or to kiss you love you same thing yeah 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 but you're so busy trying to succeed so that you can buy that thing and that thing and that thing and that thing because you have that mental obsession of what you supposed to look like from an external standpoint so that you feel good about yourself while completely ne neglecting the fact that inside truly 
you've been feeling like shit, but you won't acknowledge it because that would force you to acknowledge the cause of all the symptoms, the multiple causes of all the symptoms. Mm -hmm. so you got to make a choice, and you may not be ready to make the healthy choice. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to try to shrink that to one solution. Oh, I need psychotherapy. Oh, I need that multivitamin mineral complex. Oh, I need a gym subscription. Maybe if I go three times inside a gym, another artificial environment, artificial movement, artificial food and whatever, maybe I'll, I'll feel better. Yeah, maybe it's not going to fully address the mental cause. You got to look at the whole lifestyle. Otherwise, there's just like patches, you know. You have a balloon and it deflates and you try to reinflate the air. And oh, oh, there's a hole there. Oh, there's a hole there. There's a hole there. There's a hole there. You're looking at patches. Mm -hmm. You're looking at quick fixes. And this is the true predicament of modern human beings is that the pursuit of happiness, of satisfaction in life, does not lie on the true foundation of principles and behaviors that truly make a person healthy, truly healthy, not just the, abs the, the absence of symptoms of illness we're talking about high levels of vitality high levels of energy high levels of like drug life um strength happiness you know health freedom mm -hmm. it's it may sound like like it's some kind of philosophy but Everything that we do as humans starts with a certain mindset, a certain expectation of what we expect to experience. So when too many aspects of who you are, how you feel inside, and don't work, you don't feel good, always trying to feel, to overcome fatigue, to overcome depression, to overcome boredom, to overcome illnesses to overcome loneliness. Maybe it's time to consider that the very foundation on which you live your life is very deficient in many aspects that are not optional, but mandatory to be a healthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually fulfilled being. Mm -hmm. And there's no way around it. Mm -hmm. A Red Bull is not going to fix it. A multivitamin is not going to fix it. And even Chris, if we're going to fix it with the therapy, if people don't address the cause of the problem, they will come back to and be like, it's even worse than before. I thought yeah. I was 60 and six months later or even sooner than that, they're like, Chris, what's going on? I'll never get rid of a problem. Yeah. Well, no, you won't get rid of a problem because you have not addressed the cause. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's, it is a very um, encompassing issue, which is, as you said, it's not just the, the what we call fitness. It's everything. Sleep. It's, it's um, what we do for movement, what we do to nurture our brain, what we do to interact with people, community, all of these things. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is why today you have all those different diverse health trends. So some people talk to you about the importance of uh, um, breathing and then of you know, eating a certain way, like moving a certain way, and uh, earthing and... Uh, cold exposure and uh, intermittent fasting. And, and usually you, you hear, okay, well, that one thing is the end all and be all. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. 
No, it's not. Um, I don't do not believe that any false compartment um, of who we are, our biological needs, can be um, uh, addressed in isolation and and fix uh, your whole health, fix your whole, uh, everything. You know? there's, there's no end to um, losing your health and losing your happiness in life when the foundation of your lifestyle is, is inappropriate. But mm -hmm. there's also no end to uh, almost to gaining uh, and preserving optimum health and happiness in your life as long as you maintain the complete lifestyle that supports such high levels of health and vitality and, and, and happiness. There's no way around it. Mm -hmm. You cannot uh, biohack an unhealthy lifestyle. And if you believe you biohack anything, that's only because hopefully you're returning to some healthier, saner uh, lifestyle patterns mm -hmm. or choices mm -hmm. with enough consistency. Consistency. Mm -hmm. um, I've been consistent with my lifestyle life choices for three years. I'm not healthy or capable at 50 years old almost by chance, by because my genes or something. Like, if you compare to my dad, he was not nearly as fit and as healthy as I am now. Not even in his 30s. Mm -hmm. I look at all photos of him in his 30s and he, he doesn't look fit at all. And he was a heavy smoker. He didn't pay attention to his food. And his only exercise was to walk at least. Um, so he had this surgery issue and stuff. And he died uh, not very old. And before he did, he had tremendous health issues. So go ahead and tell me that I'm just lucky. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky that basically I was Attentive enough to make a connection between what I saw about my dad's lifestyle and health or lack thereof when I was young. When I was 16, 17, 18. I looked at that, I was like, I was like this, there's a correlation there. Obviously, and I was thinking of myself, I don't, want, I don't want that in my life. I want to be healthy. When I'm 50, I still want to be you know, healthy, strong. Yeah, as long as possible. So I started to dig into into that. Again, that was long before the internet. But I, I didn't, it, there was no way you could collect that much information back then. There was no science behind intermittent fasting or breathing or very little. Mm -hmm. But you had to experience, commit, be consistent, and see the results. Mm -hmm. So I experimented on eating a certain way. Well, again, the lifestyle was talking about vital combat, com combat vital, um, barefoot movement, lots of movement, breathing ev drills every day, uh, in you know fasting every day, being in nature often, all that. So I could tell the difference. What made me stronger, healthier, and more fit. Mm -hmm. So, what do you want? That is what it boils down to. Everybody, everybody wants the fit-looking body and the healthy body, right? But if you, if, if you tell people, you're gonna have to change things. Mm -hmm. right. Don't wanna, don't, don't wanna do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Give me the therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me the multivitamin <laughs> complex. Yeah, yeah. Give me something I can buy. Yeah. And just, you know, either I just 
eat it or drink it or like I just sit and relax, lay down and like someone does something to me and talk to me and make me feel good. And then boom, I can go again. Same thing over and over and same result. Mm-hmm. That is the hard truth. Very hard truth. This is why um, when people ask me or tell me, well, but don't you think that society is kind of breaking up and more people want to be healthy? I'm like, no. Well, you should believe in that. It's not that I don't believe in that. And I obviously invite that and I want that. And I contribute to that. But often, when you see the emergence of some lifestyles and solutions that are lifestyle based, and they start to become like little niche markets and little, like, in, you know, markets, and then you're like, that's it. It's going to go mainstream. It's going to be a big thing. Or it, it shows that society is changing. And I want to hope. So. But sometimes like, no. It just means that it's getting so bad overall. Mm-hmm. So bad. So worse. But then you have like the camp culture. Camp culture is, it gets stronger as main culture does its thing with even more, you know, like, on mass, lots of people, and uh, do 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 we have less people that are obese and diabetic and um, living indoors and um, electronically addicted and uh, depressed? Depression is so huge, mental illness and stuff. Do we have less of that? No. Okay. So that means that some people have a healthy reaction in their life, where they're like, I don't want live like this i'm going to commit to solutions i'm going to commit to choices i'm going to make myself as healthy as healthy as i can and then they go on forums and they start to be like online communities and then you have a little healthy growing vibrant camp culture but it's a counter culture it's not mainstream culture it will be different when millions and millions like when most people will be at it, making them healthy, and the people who insist on not asking themselves the right question, dismissing the fact that yes, they need a little bit of self discipline to make themselves healthy, mm-hmm. when those will be a minority. And then you have the whole culture and the media and the advertising and the, and the, the governments, the corporations brainwashing into everybody into thinking different because it's a very simple observation. The so-called, so-called health industry, number one is not the industry of health. Industry of management of sickness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a multi billion dollars industry. It's a huge industry with main players, huge corporations that are worth billions. Don't you think that they have the tools to indoctrinate people? into um, preserving the current idea of what it is, what is normal. Mm-hmm. No. People think, well, I'm healthy. If I'm not healthy, I get to the doctor, I get a pill. Period. Don't change anything. That's it. That's how I was raised. I was raised the same. I was everybody in every country. I was raised the same. I was kid, sometimes I was sick, my mom would take the doctor, the doctor would be like, oh, this. Well, go to the pharmacy and get those pills or those whatever, capsules. Take it, you know, three times a day for two weeks. And then I would take it thinking, oh yeah, that's the medicine. And I'm not in um, dismissing um, that um, the importance of science, the importance of medicine, the importance of the medical, like, oh my God, if I get an accident, I want the best surgery possible. I want the best, you know, uh, treatment possible. That's like, obviously, 
what I'm talking about, we're not talking, I'm not talking about the, the I'm talking about healers uh, um, or actually the non-healers. I'm talking about the merchants. I'm talking about the huge big interest who have no interest in modern population globally to be healthy because it would ruin and their business and take away the billions of dollars. Mm-hmm. I never go, I, I just never buy any medication. I don't make these guys any money. I don't make these corporations any money. None. Imagine if it was most people like that. Then the industries would almost completely disappear. Mm-hmm. Then they would be forced to just focus on what's really important for health, but not what's important to actually maintain sickness and manage that sickness, which mm-hmm. is a very different business. Mm-hmm. So let's not call it health industry. That's not the health industry. Mm-hmm. I probably have just completely um, made myself one more time be on the blacklist of people who should not you know, be promoted that much. <laughs> and it's okay. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Keep your billions and let's see where it all ends up being one day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not going in a good place. No, I hear you. It's not headed in a good place. It's not going to become... It's comfy on this plane maybe right now, but at some point it's not going to be enjoyable. You know, it's better to prevent redemption <laughs> than, yeah, I, than wait for it. <laughs> For, for sure, for sure. So listen, so that sounds like a good place to, to call it quits for this evening. Yeah. But I have, I'm, I, we're going to have to do this again because I got more stuff I want to ask you about, okay? Um, so, but for today, I'm going to call, uh, call it an evening. I want to say thanks to everybody who came and listened to both parts. I'm sorry it got cut off in the, in the middle. It appears that uh, Instagram shuts us off at one hour. And more importantly, I want to th- say thank you very much to Irma Lacour for oh, doing thank you, Nick, Chris. this. This and was thanks amazing. Thanks for listening. And, and we are going to do this again, my brother, because I still got more questions on my list I want to ask you. All right? With pleasure, Chris. Anytime. Perfect. Thank you very much. We'll call it a day. And everybody, we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.